Hello. I would like to very warmly welcome the global audience to the World Sepsis Congress this year, and specifically to our session, session number 12. I would say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the part of the world where you are listening and viewing us from. The theme of our session is neonatal sepsis platforms and guidelines. As a word of introduction, my name is Dr. Odira Nwankwo. I'm an associate professor of pediatrics at uh, Jefferson University in Philadelphia. I'm also a pediatric intensivist at Nemours Children's Hospital in Wilmington, Delaware. I will go ahead and uh, introduce the first speaker today. And our first speaker is Dr. Ramana Rashmina Ryan. The topic that he'll be talking about is disproportionate burden of antimicrobial resistant excess deaths experienced by neonates in low and middle income countries. Dr. Rashmi Narayan is the founder and president of One Health Trust. This was formerly known as Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy. He's an affiliate professor at the University of Washington, USA, and he has worked and published extensively on antimicrobial resistance. Ramana, I'm going to hand it over to you to kick this session off. Thank you so much uh, for that for that kind introduction. Um, so uh, I was asked to speak on the disproportionate burden of AMR deaths, which is experienced by newborns and LMICs. Now, uh, you know, the situation and how much we knew about uh, the the number of deaths caused by resistant uh, infections in newborns was, you know, the state of knowledge was not that great even about 10 years ago. This was a paper that was one of very, very few that existed at that time, a paper from Tanzania, uh, which looked at culture positive uh, uh, in, infections in, in, in newborns and how many of those died, the case fatality rate if there was a gram positive versus gram negative, if it's ESBL or if it was MRSA. And these were just, you know, really shocking figures that if you were culture positive, uh, the newborn had an almost 30% chance of dying. If they were ESBL positive, more than 50% and MRSA also more than 50%. All very worrying, which clearly indicates that newborns who are anyway at high risk for mortality, even when the antibiotics are working, are placed at even greater risk when the antibiotics stop working. Then there was this great study which uh, one of uh, the other panelists is probably going to speak about, uh, and this is because he was involved in it, and this is the Dennis study, uh, which was published out of India, three large hospitals in India. And here the data really confirmed what we'd seen in that previous study, uh, high rates of mortality, case fatality rates in culture positive sepsis due to resistant pathogens, you know, as high as 69%, uh, uh, and uh, also in carbapenems and also, you know, multidrug resistant and acinetobacter. And Klebsiella was also not far behind. So clearly, acinetobacter and Klebsiella were causing, you know, much of the of the big challenge here. And I think the, the PI on the study used to call this King Klebs, that, you know, this is really where most of the killers were in, in his uh, newborn and pediatric units. Now, uh, in the commentary that uh, Zulfi Butta and I wrote on that paper when it first came out, uh, what we did was we went and looked at other studies at the time, uh, which had looked at culture positive sepsis and culture negative sepsis to look at what the case fatality rates were, and then what happened when these were drug resistant. And this is what we found that, uh, so everything that is unshaded is the Dennis study, that what the Dennis study had found was quite spot on in terms of wherever there were comparable studies in terms of CFRs between, you know, say MRSA and MSSA. Um, for carbapenem, there wasn't really another study that we could identify, but these were pretty high. So overall, you know, this was all in the in the realm of, of now becoming believable what uh, neonatologists and pediatricians have been seeing for a long time, really showing up in the data. And then what we did was use a modeling exercise to estimate the number of drug-resistant bacteria uh, uh, related attributable uh, you know, uh, mortality in the five high burden countries. And the total number was about 214,000 across these five high burden countries. And when this paper first came out, there was, a, uh, there was an, it was part of the New York Times headlines, which showing that superbugs 
kill India's babies and pose an overseas threat. Obviously, not just India happens in many other countries as well, but because of India's size, the numbers are pretty large. But we have those other countries also to worry about. Then more recently has been the Gram study, which looked at these specific pathogens. This is not the original Gram paper. This is a follow-up paper. And if you look at just the top part, which is the neonatal period in all of these figures, you can see again, Klebsiella being quite important. It's up there in pink. Uh, you have staph and, and streptococcus pneumoniae being really important. You have other pathogens obviously being important, but you have group B strep, Klebsiella, all of these being important in terms of, of cause of infection and mortality. These all number of deaths that you can see. And the there have been three studies that have uh, also been looking very carefully at newborn sepsis and mortality. I don't have time to go into all three. One of the uh, well, two of them actually looked at resistance, and these were the Barnard study by Tim Walsh, and then the other one is the Neo-Op study, which is done by Gard P, along with Mike Sharland uh, in the UK. And then the third one was a study, obviously, of newborn uh, infection or deaths, uh, uh, regardless of cause, which is the CHAM study that I'm sure you've all you know, spent a lot of time on. Now, the Neo-Op study looked at 3,200 3, newborns recruited in 19 hospitals across 11 countries, so very, very broad. Uh, with a number of partners involved. And, uh, you know, at, at day 28, you had about, uh, you know, five deaths out of 61. Uh, and those who had been transferred and those who had been discharged, you had a live 1924. And then, uh, you know, you had about 32 deaths over there. And the most common pathogens that were found in baseline culture were, again, Klebs. And the most common antibiotics that were started you know, from baseline culture after enrollment, mostly ampicillin, gentamicin, or piptazo and amikacin. So you can see that this pattern of bugs is very similar to what, uh, you know, you also saw in the Dennis study, obviously. And even by sight, the blue is the Klebsiella, and you see that Klebsiella really accounts for a disproportionately high number of, 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 uh, of uh, deaths. And what we then did with this was, in a paper that is forthcoming in PLOS Medicine, we took data from CHAMPS, Barnards, and NEOBS and put them through a fairly straightforward model to look at the attributable, uh, you know, the, the conditional uh, property of being infected if there was an, an condition on neonatal, neonatal sepsis mortality. So if there was a child who died, what is the probability of being infected with that particular pathogen? And from that, we estimated the percentage of averted neonatal deaths by pathogen by location, uh, you know, in each of these studies. We're able to do different things. And these are the different studies, the, the red or the salmon, the green and the blue. Uh, and uh, these are the percentage of new, uh, neonatal sepsis mortalities with Klebsiella in, you know, across the study sites from these three studies. But what we were trying to do here was to evaluate the value of introducing a maternal vaccine against Klebsiella, one that, that doesn't exist right now, and to see how many deaths you could avert that way. So what we then found was you could avert a significant proportion of neonatal deaths overall and newborn case of sepsis with a maternal vaccine. You know, uh, so these are all in the obviously between the two and about six percent uh, in, in, you know, over here. And there's a number of neonatal sepsis averted deaths, which even though these are small numbers, small percentages, they translate into pretty large numbers. So you can have tens of thousands, even across these countries, which means that the global avertable burden is probably about 100 to 150,000 deaths by introducing a maternal sepsis, uh, maternal vaccine against Klebsiella. Um, and this was the antimicrobial resistance uh, distribution of these vaccine averted deaths. Uh, and you can see it by, uh, I, I'm sorry, this is small, but you can see it by antibiotic type, the immunoglycosides, uh, carbapenem, cephalosporin, and penicillin. Uh, and this is also the distribution of, uh, of by drug resistant in terms of number of uh, resistant antibiotics uh, that, uh, the, that these pathogens were resistant to. And obviously the projected impact is greatest in uh, LMICs, greater in South Asia, Asia and also in sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, the burden of neonatal sepsis is highest and where resistance also happens to be a significant issue. And we have these also by country. I'm not going to go over these in detail, but just to say that these are all pretty significant numbers of, of averted deaths in India country, you know, 20,000 averted deaths from introducing a vaccine like this um, and about 100,000 cases. So, um, you know, the, the percentages are small, but I think overall they work out to a pretty large number. So. Just to wrap up, I think, you know, this is a conference on sepsis. So I'm sure everyone knows these numbers. 2.3 million deaths every year from sepsis, 
about a fifth of these from newborn sepsis. And of these, Klebsiella is the leading cause, and a large proportion of these are drug resistant. And I think rather than just talking about the problem, we need to start getting to solutions. And I think maternal vaccines that protect newborns are really our best bet to be able to tackle this problem in the short to medium term until the health systems get up to speed to be able to prevent these uh, infections in the first place. So with that, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Ramana, for this very, very insightful talk. I um, I looked at the questions from the audience. You, we don't specifically have any questions. You have a lot of greetings from UAE, from Qatar, from Athens. Um, okay. But I'm just going to ask you a general question. And please, if you have an answer, go ahead. If you don't have, that's fine. We can talk about it. I understand that Klebsiella tilts um, this game so much in, in uh, low resource setting, both for early and late neonatal sepsis. Mm -hmm. um, in developed countries where GBS, E. coli, form the more bulk uh, bugs that cause early neonatal, neonatal sepsis, we have chemoprophylaxis for these organisms. Mm -hmm. What I want you to tell us, if you know, is what what part of the body is Klebsiella in the moms? Where do these kids get that from? From the mom, from the environment, and is there any chance, even before the vaccine comes out, is there any chance of some sort of chemoprophylaxis on the mom before the 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 the, uh, the children are born? Like some sort of decolonization procedure. Yes, yes. You know, that's a great question. And I have to admit that the person who should answer that question is actually Jeeva, who's probably your next speaker. He's a clinician and he'd be able to answer that question in terms of whether chemoprophylaxis can work for prevention of uh, of Klebsiella infections. I, I know people are working with, you know, monoclonal antibodies, for instance, in the sort of the same space with that idea. But, uh, but what you're pointing out is, uh, is an interesting idea. But let me also say that even for group B strep, um, there's talk of actually getting a vaccine in because we should not be using antibiotics so much for prophylaxis uh, because we don't know of the side effects that might lead to, you know, potentially more resistant infections if one is actually transmitted. That would certainly be a concern um, that that I would, I would express. Um, but I, I think that... Uh, you know, the vaccine space may work for some of these other pathogens where, like group E strep, where we're currently relying on antibiotics. Yeah, excellent. The only reason I brought it up is that, you know, you and I know this, that the vaccines take years yes. to come to fruition. But if there's a way, more so for low and middle income countries where Klebsiella is, have actually tilted this game, if there's yeah. a way to decolonize moms before uh, delivery, that might be a game changer. Why? Hopefully who works for the vaccine. But thank you so much for Absolutely. your insightful talk. Um, again, I don't think... Okay, yeah, there's a question for you. Um, so the question is, is time and type of antibiotics prophylaxis important to reduce neonatal sepsis if given before cesarean section? I think that's, again, a question for the, you know, for the clinicians in terms of what antibiotic prophylaxis they're using uh, before C-section. So not not familiar with that space. We just grow, deal with the large numbers uh, in in terms of, you know, where the epidemiological evidence is. So I, I might suggest asking that from Jiva as well. All right. So thank you so much. I'm going to, I hope I remember to ask Jiva this when it comes to his own session. <laughs> I, I left um, a lot of stuff for him to deal with, <laughs> but he he can deal with it. Yeah. All right. I, uh, I would... Um, I would wait for him but probably when it comes to him for him to um, answer that question. I, I'm, a, I'm an intensivist. If I were a neonatologist, I probably might give you an answer. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Ramana. Sure. We're well, going to go ahead to um, to the next speaker. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Vanessa Kwan. She will be speaking on incidence and burden of neonatal sepsis in South Africa. Dr. Kwan is a medical doctor with special interests in child health and infectious diseases. She works at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases in South Africa, and she has the JAM South Africa Surveillance Platform. Dr. Kwan, take it over from here. I'm going to talk about the incidence and burden of neonatal sepsis in South Africa. 
Um, and as we know that the burden of neonatal deaths are in low and middle income countries and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and that the gaps in the population level data on neonatal bloodstream infections in low and middle income countries, and that there is little information in sub-Saharan Africa. And where there are um, studies in these areas on characteristics of neonates, these focus on single hospital sites that are usually central hospitals like large urban academic centers. So we were funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we wanted to explore neonatal bloodstream infections and meningitis in all hospital tiers, um, particularly focusing on non-central hospitals like provincial, regional, and district-level hospitals. And South Africa, the set, in the South African setting, most of our babies are born in hospital, um, and so we wanted to look at the following things. Our objectives were to determine baseline incidence of laboratory confirmed sepsis amongst neonates um, over a six year period at all levels of healthcare and to measure the impact of interventions. Um, it was also to confirm etiologies and antimicrobial resistant prevalence in pathogens causing sepsis um, at all tier levels. And we published this. Um, study last year in Globe, Lancet Global Health um, on culture-confirmed neonatal bloodstream infections and meningitis in South Africa. We're also looking to determine the characteristics of neonates who develop sepsis and risk factors for death. And these are at provincial, regional, district levels. So we did a cross-sectional analysis of neonatal bloodstream infections and meningitis. We had two tiers. Um, the first one was a national laboratory-based surveillance tier, where we looked at blood culture and cerebrospinal fluid cultures from January 2014 to December 2019, using a national pathology data warehouse um, from the NHLS, which is our laboratory system that serves 80% of the population um, and is only public sector um, hospitals. And then we looked at annual registered live births to calculate the incidence risk. We also then looked at a sentinel enhanced surveillance um, study, where we which we did in October 2019 to September 2020 at six non-centralized hospital sites. And these are the ones in green. And the reason we selected these were that they were the ones with the highest number of cases. Um, in 2016. And although they are designated provincial hospitals, they function as the center of excellence for that province. Um, medical records were scanned and required data were extracted by medical officers on a standard form. So looking at um, the characteristics of neonates, we had um, the, the median age was seven days, mostly male, um, more than half of the cases were from regional hospitals and late onset sepsis was particularly high. We didn't have, um, we only had basic demographics for these and no clinical data. So nationally, specimen collection rate overall was 77 per thousand live births. Incidence rate, incidence risk of infection um, 6.6 6 per thousand live births in early onset 1.1 per thousand live births but late onset 4.9 per thousand live births the proportion of positive blood cultures was nine percent and um, the incidence of Klebsiella pneumonia 1.8 per thousand live births with a contamination rate of nine percent the majority of our pathogens were gram negative bacteria and um, gram-positive bacteria making up 36% and fungi 7%. Um, gram-negative bacteria, uh, Ipsiella pneumonia and Acinetobacter um, baumannii um, were the most common pathogens. So in South Africa, we use the WHO first-line antibiotics and third-generation kephrosporins for neonatal sepsis. And at neonatal centers, they use piperacillin, tazobactam, and amikacin for hospital-associated infections and meropenem for meningitis or life-threatening sepsis. 
Antimicrobial resistance in gram-negative isolates was high, particularly in late onset sepsis. There was high resistance in the first line WHO antibiotics and in the kephlosporins. And antimicrobial resistance was as high in the regional hospitals as, it were, as they were in the central hospitals. So from tier two, which was at our non-central hospitals, six sites, um, we had 2,613 isolates collected on neonates with suspected sepsis. 900 of these sepsis episodes, um, majority of which were late onset sepsis. And there was a similar breakdown in pathogens as in tier one, um, gram negatives making up two thirds of sepsis. But in regional hospitals in tier one, um, there was a higher gram positive um, bacteria um, load than there were in tier two. Our selected tier two sites may so may so may not be representative of all the regional hospitals because that's that is the difference that we saw. So the top five pathogens were Klebsiella pneumoniae, Escherichia coli, Staphylococcus aureus, Enterococcus faecum, and Streptococcus agalactiae. Klebsiella pneumonia predominated in all hospital presentations, early onset, late onset, inborn hospital associated um, infections, as well as community um, late onset sepsis. So the community late onset sepsis are those who are born in hospital, discharged, and then readmitted again. And um, the community um, late onset sepsis organisms were mostly Klebs pneumonia, Staph aureus, and E. coli and, and group B strep. And then group B strep was the commonest pathogen in early onset sepsis, and it was also um, a cause of community late onset sepsis. We also showed a very high resistance to WHO first line antibiotics, Ampi and Genta, and to Kephlosporins. Um, and in tier two, they were almost as high as in the academic centers. We showed an increased resistance to carbapenems. So the neonatal characteristics in, um, in bloodstream infections more than half of them were male. Seventy percent of the neonates were bloodstream of bloodstream infections were preterm. The median gestational age of thirty-three weeks and low birth weight of one thousand six hundred seventy grams. A quarter of our babies died, and the HIV exposure was high, and it's very similar to that um, of our antenatal HIV prevalence for South Africa um, at thirty-four percent. But neonates that were HIV infected was less than one percent. So factors associated with death in neonates with bloodstream infections included having a gram-negative pathogen, inborn late onset sepsis, um, which is hospital-associated infection, admission to in, in um, neonatal ICU, and being preterm. Conclusions for Tier 1 was that there is high incidence risk of late onset sepsis with provisional variation, provincial variations. Klebsiella pneumonia was the number one cause of neonatal bloodstream infections in South Africa at all levels of healthcare. That there were high levels of antimicrobial resistance, which raises concerns about the empirical use of first line WHO antibiotics and kephlosporins, and an increasing resistance to carbapenems. And the prevention efforts should focus on general infection prevention measures um, in the neonatal units. Revised empirical regimens urgently are needed to, um, because of this increasing resistance, antimicrobial stewardship and identifying targets for potential maternal vaccines. And our conclusions for Tier 2 is that there is a dominance of gram-negative pathogens similar to the centralized hospitals. Two-thirds of the infections by Klebsiella pneumonia, Escherichia pneumoniae, Enterococcus faecium, Staph aureus, and Streptococcus agalactiae, and that Klebsiella pneumonia, Escherichia pneumoniae, and Enterococcus faecium have extremely high drug resistance of over 80% in our setting. 69% of our bloodstream episodes were in preterms. Um, of low birth weight, and that was long hospital stays. Our late onset sepsis was higher than our early onset sepsis, and these are multidrug resistant pathogens. 
Our early onset sepsis was group B strep. There was a lot of antimicrobial resistance. 60% of our gram-negative isolates were resistant to the WHO first-line combination therapy of Ampia and Genta, and 66% resistant to carbapenems. There was high in-hospital mortality. 26% of our babies died. And gram-negative pathogens, preterm births, late onset hospital associated infections and admission to a neonatal ICU were associated with death. So our non-centralized hospitals have a huge number of preterm and low birth weight infants and resource allocation should be made available for infection prevention control since more of our preterms are surviving. And I'd just like to acknowledge the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation and all the people who were part of this project. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Juan, for your excellent talk on um, the data you provided on the incidence and burden of neonatal sepsis in South Africa. I have one question from the audience. Um, it is, it's not in the question column, it's in the comments. And this was a question that came right as you were speaking. And you mentioned in your talk that Klebsiella pneumonia is... Uh, uh, the commonest cause of neonatal sepsis in South Africa. And this question is asking you, how e effective is miropenem and amikacin for neonatal pneumonia? Okay, so let me show you this here two slide. Miropenem, we have an overall 37% um, resistance to that. And this is for, this is for bacterium except um, for Culture confirmed sepsis. So I know in other hospitals in other countries, they also do um, uh, clinical diagnosis of sepsis, but ours were laboratory confirmed culture positive. All right. Uh, do, do you have anything on, uh, on amikacin? Amikacin, um, not on amikacin alone. Um, well, we do have it, but it's, it's not in my slides. Okay. I can't remember exactly what they were. No, that's fine. I actually have a general question for you, but my concern is the time. We are already at the 11 uh, mark. Um, otherwise, uh, maybe uh, towards the end, if you're still there, I'm going to ask you. But uh, we're going to thank you so much. We're going to move to the next speaker. And um, the third speaker for our session today is Dr. Jiva Shankar. Uh, he's going to be talking on neonatal sepsis and treatment challenges in India. Dr. Sankar is an additional professor in the Division of Neonatology, Department of Pediatrics at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. His primary interest is in neonatal sepsis, quite appropriate. Uh, Dr. Shankar, you take it from here. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I will briefly uh, talk about neonatal sepsis and the treatment challenges we face in India. I would. Uh, broadly talk about the burden of sepsis, what we face in India, the incidence and the case fatality rates, what's the pathogen profile and how it's different from the typical uh, profile which is seen in high income countries. And lastly, I will uh, talk about the antimicrobial resistance and, and the treatment challenges because of this resistance, although it has been covered in the previous talk to some extent. So a uh, burden, I will talk about two uh, major studies done by our group. The first one is the DENI, so the Delhi Neonatal Infection Study, which is uh, the results of which were published in the Lancet Global Health in 2016. And uh, briefly, we had four level three neonatal units in Delhi, of which three uh, units were inborn units, and one was an outborn unit, uh, basically a children's hospital, and was uh, uh, admitting only referred neonates. We enrolled about 70,000 units in this, uh, in this uh, collaboration study. And we had active surveillance. It was not a, uh, a passive surveillance done by the routine clinical team. It was a research team actively monitoring the babies and following them up and then labeling the babies as uh, septis or not based on uniform standard operating procedure and strict quality control. And if you look at the burden from the Denny study, we look only at the inborn baby we have about 14.3% uh, of the babies having been diagnosed with sepsis. That is one-seventh of all the NICU admissions, the ICU admissions in the newborn unit had sepsis, and that's quite high. And of which 40%, more than 40% were culture positive sepsis. And if you look at the outborn, that's a number is staggering. It's more than half 
uh, of all the medical admissions that were referred from other hospitals or from home to the, the tertiary level hospital at sepsis. And of course, the culture of positive sepsis was not that high in this case. So if you move from the tertiary level, this is a level, Dennis was done in level three hospitals, we move from one end to the other end, that is a community. I would take the uh, help of Anisa study, which is the etiology of neonatal infections in South Asia, done by uh, Samir Saha and, uh, and others, uh, Abdullah Baki and uh, other uh, prominent uh, investigators with the pain of funding from Gates Foundation. And they uh, did this study in the community. They did the study in five sites in Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. Two sites were from India, Odisha, and uh, Tamil Nadu. And of, they enrolled not only neonates, they also enrolled young infants, that is still 59 days of life. And uh, what is the difference uh, from this, uh, Dennis was, they, uh, from culture, they also did molecular assay. What they found was almost the same as what we uh, found in Dennis. The instance of bacterial and viral infection was 13.2 and 10.1 per thousand live births, which is what we found, we found about 22 per thousand live births. And here it's about 23 per thousand live births. So the incidence doesn't seem to be much different, whether it's a community or a, a level uh, three uh, hospital. Now, what is left is a uh, level two unit, which is what we call in India, the district level hospitals, or uh, what we uh, call as a special care V1 units. So we did a study which is uh, uh, funded by the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We, it was done in uh, five uh, tertiary, uh, level two units or district hospitals across India. And uh, they, uh, we enrolled about 6,600 new units. And it was, uh, again, we followed the procedures what we followed in Dennis. It was active surveillance using uniform standard operating procedures and the quality control. What we found was the proportion of units with sepsis any such like uh, culture positive or culture negative sepsis was about uh, 27%. It's about, you can say roughly, more than one fourth of all the admissions to the special care one unit had sepsis. And uh, it just, what was different from Dennis was that the culture positive sepsis was not that common. It was roughly about 10% of all the total sepsis was culture positive sepsis. Just in contrast, in Dennis, we had about 40% of total sepsis was culture positive sepsis. So there seems to be uh, over diagnosis of culture negative sepsis, or possibly uh, the, these babies are, uh, were, had some other reasons that the culture positive rates were lower. What about the moving on to the case fatality rate? If we look at the Dennis study, uh, if, if you look at the culture positive sepsis, it's about 47.6% of the babies who had sepsis died. That means every other baby who had culture positive sepsis died. That's quite high. And that was not uh, seen in culture negative sepsis, which is only about 8.8 uh, .8 or 9 percent. So it's about one fifth of what we saw in culture positive sepsis. We'll uh, look at the level two units, that is the district hospitals. If you look at the case fatality rate, it's about 36 percent. So, I mean, not very different from what we saw in level, uh, level three unit or the daily study. So about one third of new units with culture positive sepsis die even within uh, a level two unit or a, a special cavity one unit. Again, the case fatal rate for culture negative sepsis was not that high. Now, how do we compare when we uh, compare our uh, rates of uh, case fatality to a developed country or high income country? So this is a comparison from NACHD, it's a relatively old study, but this study included only very low birth weight preterm units. So we expect a slightly higher case total rate, and it was 2002, so in 20 years, it, there might be improvement, but still I took this as a reference to show the stark contrast. So if you look at the study from National Institute of Science and from United States of America, the case total was only 18%, and that is in a selectively high-risk population. Whereas in Dennis, which is not a high risk population, it was in the case fatal rate of culture positive sepsis was about 48%. So we had three fold higher fatality case fatal rate when compared to a typical high income country setting. Now, moving on to the pathogen profile. So in Dennis, we found uh, Acinetobacter as the co most common organism, followed by Klebsiella. And the fourth common was the E. coli and Pseudomonas. The third common was the coagulus negative staphylococci. So there was a clearly a gram negative predominance, which is very different from what is described from in the literature from high income countries. In the previous speaker from South Africa, she also mentioned gram negative predominance and clepsilla pneumonia as the commonest organism. 
So if you look at the level two units, again, uh, from what we found in a special kidney one unit, again, it's almost same as the Denise. So Klebsiella was the most common organism, followed by E. coli and Coagulus nigris, Staphylococcus the third, uh, the fourth and fifth were, again, gram-negative enterobacter and Serratia mast cells. So again, there was a gram-negative predominance. And if you look at Streptococcus and this of which, only 4% of which group B Streptococcus was about 1%. One, 1%. So uh, what is different is there's a gram-negative predominance and absence almost uh, uh, in a rare event of gram-positive uh, group B Streptococcus infection occurring in India. And if you look at the pathogens and the onset, I'll just uh, briefly mention this. So this is on the x-axis, we have the days. And on the y-axis, we have the, uh, the percent proportions. And if you look at different organisms, for example, this is a uh, blue is Astrodobacter. So Astrodobacter is there on day one, day two, and day three. That is the early onset sepsis, what we have uh, uh, labeled as this. Is, um, to the left is the early onset sepsis. To the right is late onset sepsis. Again, that is the same Astrodobacter is there on the, on the other days as well. And that goes true for other organisms. So the pathogens are not very different, whether it is early onset or late onset. Again, this is different from what we traditionally learn from high income country. Well, moving on to the antimicrobial testing, the last part. So if you look at the Dennis data, this Dr. Ramanan has already highlighted this. I will just highlight uh, uh, the most important uh, aspect of this. So if you look at Klebsiella, the multidegressance is more than half. More than half uh, of the Klebsiella isolates are multidrug resistant. And if you look at the astrodobacter, more than 80% are uh, multidrug resistant. Equally, slightly fares better. So about only 40% are multidrug resistant. Whereas if you look at coagulus negative staphylococci or staph aureus, 40 to 60% are resistant to methicillin, thus mandating a treatment with vancomycin. So that's a 55 to 80% multidrug resistant uh, incidence in uh, the level three units. And what about level two units? Again, if you look at the third generation of the sporine, ceftriaxone, so you can see 80%, 90%, 70% resistance. The common gram negative pathogens are about 70 to 80% resistant to cephalosporins. And to meropenem, they are about 50% resistant to meropenem as well. And that's quite uh, alarming. And if you look at staph aureus and coagulus and staphylococci, okay, again, 40 to 60% are resistant to methicillin. Again, the, uh, the need for vancomycin treatment in these babies. So there's a high resistance to cephalosporins and moderate resistance to carbapenems. And that's uh, reflected in this uh, for a treatment chart. I just uh, highlighted one treatment chart from a level, a level three unit. This is actually from a cardiac, uh, neonatal cardiac ICU, but this is uh, true for many neonatal ICUs as well. So this baby, over uh, about 15 days, has received amoxiclav and amica to begin with, followed by piperacillin and tazobacter, then ceftriaxone, then ticoplanin, then ending up with viropenum, ciproplasticine, and finally cholesterol. And it also, the baby receives septacetin abibactam, and of course, we, the baby receives fluconazole and Casper funding. So that's the nature of treatment that baby might receive in, in the Indian setting uh, that, that is actually uh, disordered with and high antimicrobial resistance. So we don't have much of antibiotic choice, and many neonatal units have Mirapenum and vancomycin as the first antibiotic of uh, uh, first line antibiotic, which is mostly different from what the literature recommends. So, how will you manage this? So, we have to look at the go back to the basics to prevent infections, better diagnosis, and appropriate treatment. So, I would just highlight one thing for preventing infections. This is again highlighted by Dr. Raman in his talk, but I would uh, use the, uh, the district hospital study to highlight again uh, the fact that. The mortality among babies who had culture positive sepsis, but they who received antibiotics as per the sensitivity of the pathogens. So that means they received antibiotics which are actually later turned out to be sensitive. The bugs were sensitive to those antibiotics. So there the case fatality rate was 35.1%. On the other hand, the antibiotics were resistant, or the baby received those resistant antibiotics for uh, the resistant uh, the, the, the bugs were resistant to those an antibiotics for the first 48 hours after suspicion. There, the, uh, the case for is 43%. So not very different. So whether it's resistant or sensitive, the case for rate or the mortality was not very different. It's almost equal. So again, reiterating the fact that you have to prevent sepsis, to prevent the antimicrobial resistance induced deaths. So to summarize, in India, the issues broadly are the high burden of sepsis and a high case fatal rate. There's a grand negative predominance and uh, almost a conspicuous absence of a group B streptococci. 
And if you look at the profile, it's not very different whether it is early onset or late onset. And there is a high degree of antimicrobial resistance. And therefore, there is a need for a comprehensive program to address such this. And that's what we are currently doing to address the, uh, uh, the molecular biology of sepsis to address these issues. I think I'll stop with this. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shankar, for your excellent presentation. What I can tell you is that you're getting a lot of um, a lot of praise for your presentation. Um, I see a lot of good presentation, Mr. Jav J Jiva, and uh, people are applauding what you did. And that's quite good. I do not have any question from the audience for you. Um, there are so many questions for Dr. Vanessa Kwan, but I think she she left for for some other reasons. But I'll have a general question for you, um, Dr. Shankar. And that is yeah. from your experience in India. Um, what do you see more? Do you see more of early onset neonatal sepsis? or late onset? And if um, if you answer that, I would also extend that to ask you, what combination, what antibodies combination do you find most helpful? Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so the first question, uh, so uh, early onset sepsis is much more common than late onset sepsis. So it's about, uh, you can say about two thirds, and in some series it's about three fourths. Uh, so roughly, I would say 60 to 70 percent are early onset sepsis, and the remaining are late onset sepsis. With the pitfall that many, uh, most of the studies have actually uh, reported infection only till discharge. So some of the babies might uh, get discharged and then develop late onset sepsis. So there might be some underestimation of late onset sepsis, but still, I believe uh, roughly 60 to 70 percent of total sepsis on or in newborns are actually early onset sepsis. That's important uh, in India. But the second question is what antibiotic because there's a high prevalence of antimicrobial resistance. So what how am I going to treat? So many units, uh, many units in India, they treat the first line antibiotic, uh, they what they use, they treat the units with citrofloxacin and amicacin or fitracin and tasobactam amicacin. So that's the most commonly used combination. So almost uh, uh, I, I, as far as I can understand, I mean, uh, none of the units, the level three units use ampicillin or uh, uh, gentamicin as a first line. Uh, some units do use cefetoxin and uh, amicacin as a first line, but most units have gone uh, ahead and then start using either citrofloxamica or piperacin and tasobactam and amica. And uh, unfortunately, some units, they uh, have mirapenam as the first line antibiotic. That's very unfortunate. Right. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shankar. Yeah, no problem. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Shankar. We're going to move, I think we're doing well with our time. We'll move ahead with the fourth speaker. And our first speaker today is Dr. Udrak Okomo. Uh, she is going to be speaking on invasive bloodstream infections and antimicrobial resistance in Africa, approaches to treatment, and next steps. Dr. Okomo is a clinical research fellow in maternal and newborn health with the Vaccines and Immunity Team, Medical Research Council Unit, the Gambia, at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's a pediatrician. All right. So, Dr. Okoma, I just gave a brief introduction of you, and uh, I'm going to let you take it away from here. Thank you for the, the warm introduction. And so I'll be talking about um, invasive bloodstream infections, but from the, the perspective of newborns um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and I'll touch on the approaches to treatment and the next steps. So um, in order to treat newborns with sepsis, is important certain things are cardinal. Um, we must be able to diagnose the infection and detect the pathogens. And we should be able to have a knowledge of the local pathogen epidemiology. And guidance to treatment is um, usually based on the antimicrobial resistance patterns. And this will enable us to choose the appropriate antimicrobial. And so um, briefly looking at detection of pathogens, nowadays, um, what is popular is the use of automated blood cultures. So blood cultures remain the standard for diagnosing infections. But a lot of settings in sub-Saharan Africa still use manual blood cultures. There are some slight differences in terms of pathogen yield. And also what is also critical is the time to 
um, a positive result, which is much quicker with the automated blood cultures. And so um, a retrospective review of the etiology of invasive bacterial infection um, in sub-Saharan Africa looked at um, over 81 studies that reported um, blood culture techniques for neonatal sepsis. And the majority of the, the, the settings used um, manual cultures and not automated cultures. Then also, um, as um, I mentioned earlier, that we would need to be, have an understanding of the local pathogen epidemiology. Um, the epidemiology of infection could change with time. And so we carried out a systematic review of neonatal sepsis in, in sub-Saharan Africa um, between 2008, looking at um, data published between 2008 and 2018. So this was just over 82 studies and over 52,000 neonates from 26 countries. Um, as Vanessa, the earlier speaker, had mentioned, most studies from the region usually publish um, from um, urban tertiary referral centers. What was interesting was that for bacteria sepsis, as was reported, um, we did see a, pre a preponderance of gram-negative infections. So Klebsiella and E. coli represented over 30% of infections, though the most common pathogen was actually Staph aureus. And there's a slightly different picture for um, neonatal meningitis, where group B strep was the most common. But overall, all the pathogens causing neonatal meningitis were gram-positive. Looking at this um, critically by, by region in, in, on the continent. There were slight sub-regional geographic variations in the distribution of the specific pathogens, but essentially we still had the same Staph aureus, Klebsiella, and E. coli being the major causes of um, bacteremia or, or sepsis. Um, but the findings are also um, similar to what Vanessa presented for Southern Africa, where group B strep is an important cause of neonatal bacteremia. And studies like um, the um, one of the offshoots of the Barnard study, which was published in 2021, have also shown that the pathogens um, have not changed um, between when the systematic review data was published and as of 2021, the main causes of neonatal sepsis in sub-Saharan Africa still remain um, um, gram-negative um, infections and Klebsiella pneumonia, Klebsiella species and E. coli are very significant pathogens. Again, also what's noticed that Klebsiella being a cause of um, neonatal sepsis is mostly associated with hospital outbreaks. And so healthcare associated infections in neonatal units are a major cause of mortality. And this is important when we want to look at prevention. So looking again at antimicrobial resistance. So this also, again, is from the same retrospective systematic review that was done. And it showed that um, out of um, 63 studies reported antimicrobial susceptibility data from 17 countries, and 29 studies had pathogen-specific data. And what was shown that there was a widespread resistance to WHO-recommended antibiotics. And this is as far back as 2008 when these studies, um, some of these studies were published. But what was also noticed that there was increasing resistance to alternative therapeutic options such as the fluoroquinolones, the carbapenems, and um, epiracillin tazobactam. Again, looking at it by region, we found out that there were differences in the um, antimicrobial resistance reported across the regions, even though this was based on very scant data. So um, only 17 countries out of over 50 countries in sub-Saharan Africa had data. But what was interesting was that the first line of um, WHO um, recommended first line antibiotics were there's widespread resistance to this across the regions. Um, from this study, none of the studies reported um, minimum inhibitory concentrations to the antibiotics. So this was made it difficult to, um, to assess if there was intermediate or decreased susceptibility. Again, this, um, this data is mirrored by more recent data, again, from the, the SAN study, where it showed that um, the enterobacterialis, so Klebsiella pneumonia and E. coli, which are major causes of sepsis, harbored multiple um, resistance genes to cephalosporins and carbapenems. And also all of the isolated pathogens were resistant to multiple antibiotic classes, including those used to treat neonatal sepsis. 
so if sepsis is to guide our antibiotic um antimicrobial regimens, then what regimens are we using? So looking at the systematic review and what um, um, the data that was published, um, most of the, the countries did use WHO recommended first line and antibiotics. So the WHO recommends the use of ampicillin or um, penicillin and gentamicin as first line treatment for sepsis and a third generation cephalosporin um, as a second line treatment. And then when staph infection, Staphylococcus aureus infection is um, suspected, um, recommends the use of um, flucloxacillin. And, but we find out that in many of these um, settings, physicians were forced to use um, last line agents such as the, the carbapenems due to high degree of resistance to the um, recommended antibiotics. And you can see here that um, uh, for the, um, the antibiotics um, in red and in bold. So these were second line um, antibiotics recommended by WHO being actually used as first line in many of the studies that were published, as well as the meropenems and piperacillin tazobactam being used as first line antibiotics. Again, looking at more recent data from um, the Barnard study, the, and which included four African sites, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Nigeria, and South Africa. The four most commonly prescribed antibiotic combinations were ampicillin and gentamicin, keftazidim and amikacin, piperacillin, tazobactam and amikacin, amoxicillin, clavulanid, and um, amikacin. And um, gram-negative isolates were resistant to um, ampicillin, over 97% of them, and over 70% were resistant to gentamicin. So essentially, the WHO recommended antibiotics are no longer as um, relevant as they were when they were first recommended. So what do we do? What are the next steps we should take from here? So it's important that we're able to improve our ability to detect infections. And this is important because um, in some settings, 90% of babies would receive antibiotics without any form of investigations. The blood culture remains the the gold standard of um, treatment, uh, sorry, the gold standard of um, pathogen detection. And so laboratories across the region need to be um, supported to be able to provide a rapid response. And we also hope to be able to move on to point of care diagnostics. Looking at antibiotic protocols, we can see that there's antibiotic regimens, the antimicrobials, there's quite a wide range of um, antimicrobials being used. And we need to be able to improve antibiotic prescribing practices, antibiotic policies, and antimicrobial stewardship. So it's um, hope that newer studies um, would be, um, newer antimicrobials would be available and also cheaper ones. And um, currently there, um, um, I'll talk about this um, shortly, um, studies that are investigating new antibiotic regimens. Um, also, looking at antimicrobial resistance, it's important for us to understand the vectors of transmission, given the fact that the predominant pathogens causing um, neonatal sepsis are gram-negative um, pathogens, which are associated with healthcare, um, associated infections, and uh, outbreaks in neonatal units. And so we need to look at the vectors of transmission, and also we're able to need to look at surveillance of antimicrobial resistance and keep an eye on this to be able to guide um, antimicrobial choices. Infection prevention and control is important, and um, this is not just limited to hand hygiene, but also how we keep our environments clean, and also how we um, prepare and reconstitute our antibiotics, and we use intravenous fluids. So um, the study, one of the studies that was conducted in West Africa, looking at um, outbreaks in neonatal units, found out that the outbreaks were due to um, intrinsic contamination of intravenous fluids that were being um, given to the newborns. And so newborns were getting um, hospital acquired infections as early as the first day of life when they started um, antibiotics. And of course, we need um, investment. There has been a lot of talk about WHO supporting countries, but locally countries need to be able to invest resources in detection, provision of antimicrobials and um, surveillance of antimicrobial resistance, as well as um, infection prevention and control. And we also need to be able to um, focus on research locally and contextually specific research. Um, in terms of um, 
new antibiotics. So um, the data from the United States of Sepsis Observational Study have now um, gone on to um, um, carry out um, clinical trials looking at um, three potentially new treatments, um, as well as existing the existing commonly used antibiotic regimens. And this include phosphomycin, amicacin, um, floxometh, amicacin, and flo- flomoxeph, phosphomycin. And so these studies um, have started this year. Sorry, the, start, the first phase started in, in 2022. Um, in Kenya and South Africa. And this year, the main trial is scheduled to start and will expand to up to 10 countries. So we hope to be able to see if we may be able to introduce new antibiotic regimens. But that the, a, the new antibiotic regimens on themselves don't solve the problem if we don't have good um, prescribing policies and antimicrobial stewardship. And I just want to add that um, what also what's needed is actually a paradigm shift. So earlier on in the conference yesterday and earlier today, in some of the sessions, they've been talking about how working in silos actually does um, limit our ability to tackle antimicrobial resistance. And I think um, as a region, um, countries need no longer work in silos, but they should actually think about collaborating across countries and across the regions. And so there's really a time for a paradigm shift in our strategic thinking and planning on how to manage neonatal sepsis and antimicrobial resistance. And I'm happy to say that the over 300 African neonatologists and pediatricians have decided to rise to the challenge. And in 2021, the African Neonatal Association was established with um, members from across 36 countries and um, in the continent. And um, the, the association is focusing on research, education, advocacy, and collaboration. And it's um, it consists of eight working groups, including neonatal sexes, and really looking at context-specific um, issues in the continent and being able to collaborate and harness the power of teamwork and being able to advocate for our, um, our health ministries, our governments, and other partners to invest more in neonatal care in the continent. And on that note, I'd like to thank everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Okomo, for your very insightful talk. Um, I I have a general question, but I think you have one question from the audience, and that is what wipes one step, what wipes in parentheses one step cleaning can be used to clean surfaces like in a nursery? Okay, thanks. So um, I don't think it's... Uh... I think we need to move away from a magic bullet or something that can do everything. So cleaning is a process and cleaning is a skill. And um, the Neonatal units, we've just conducted a study whereby we we trained um, um, cleaners and cleaning champions in neonatal units on the art of cleaning in neonatal units, which is quite different from other um, departments in the hospital. And um, there are several steps. And also the cleaning agents that would be used in the neonatal unit are slightly different um, from that which are used in other um, settings. And it also depends on whether there's um, their body fluids, um, blood um, and other body fluids um, in the vicinity and um, what equipment are being used, if the equipment are going to be used um, are reused or if they're single use and, um, and so many other factors need to be taken into consideration. So um, I wouldn't recommend a single wipe. Very good. Thank you so much. And you have one more question. I think I probably will just leave mine for now. But uh, someone wants to know, is the investment of resources in AMS programs essential in developing countries? Dr. Okomo. Yes, I think all developing countries, every country needs to be able to invest in the health of its people. And that's really what the um, SDGs and universal health coverage are about. So yes, antimicrobial resistance, we can see that it's um, it's a, a challenge. In terms of, um, when you say ASM, you mean antimicrobials? What is the um, I mean? think that's AMS is just an abbreviation that I do not know exactly what it means. <laughs> um, so perhaps the person could qualify. Does it mean antimicrobials? Yeah, it means uh, and AMS stewardship. So I would think it's antimicrobial stewardship. stewardship. Yes, yeah. antimicrobial stewardship is important. In a lot of countries, 
um, anti, um, there are no policies for prescribing. And when there are no policies, you can see that there's a wide range of antibiotics that are used. Um, in some studies, some babies within a, a two week period had received six different sets of antibiotics. And then this is not helpful if they're given empirically without any culture data. So yes, investment is needed. All right, thank you so much. Um, the, what, the question that I have for you is a comment and I think I just have to make that comment. And that is that uh, from what you told us, the first line a combination medication for neonatal sepsis, uh, according to WHO guideline, do not work. Um, and the uh, the resistance is so high. And I'm wondering for the next steps, is WHO doing anything about this? Do they need to change their guideline? Um, and those other combinations that seem to be working, are they readily available? I don't think that you need to answer that right now. I think what we're going to do is if we have time at the end of the day, we'll, we'll get to that. But I think we'll have to go to our... Uh, the next speaker. And thank you so much, Dr. Komo. You did a, a fantastic job. Um, our last but not the least speaker is, um, you have to forgive me if I mess up your last name, uh, is Dr. Julia Bialiki. Uh, she's going to be speaking on next steps for NeoSEP. And Dr. Bialiki is a pediatrician and a researcher at St. George's University of London and the University Children's Hospital of Basel, I think is in Switzerland. And she's also the lead for a large UK-based randomized factorial trial of antibiotics dose and duration in childhood community-acquired pneumonia. Dr. Bialiki, uh, you take it from here. You are our last speaker. <laughs> That's Thank fine. You. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction. and. Uh, so I'm glad that um, Uduak actually introduced uh, the trial that I'm going to be speaking about already. So that um, is, is a, a big advantage for me. So I've been asked to provide a little bit more information about um, this particular uh, trial called NeoSEP. Um, and um, what I would like to do is just to tell you um, about this trial um, uh, to really um, uh go through why we've chosen uh, this particular trial as, um, in our view, the key one to be conducted to address some of the uh, uh, issues that have already been discussed today, um, and then show you um, a little bit about how we plan to operationalize um, this, and finally just take a glance at an, a sort of um, infrastructure or research architecture that will accommodate this trial and future uh, trials looking at other uh, questions around antibiotic management of uh, neonatal sepsis, um, taking a very global perspective. So I want to start with um, uh, recapitulating on some of the data uh, that you have already uh, looked at with some of the previous speakers. So these are um, data from our own observational cohort co called NeoOBS um, that we conducted as a, um, a way of uh, establishing what the landscape around uh, neonatal sepsis uh, management, particularly antibiotic management, uh, might be globally. Um, this was a large cohort study that was conducted between 2018 and 2020 and recruited uh, more than 3,200 infants with neonatal sepsis uh, from 19 sites in 11 countries, virtually um, covering all the inhabited regions of the globe. And uh, we were quite interested to see um, both how these babies were managed, uh, uh, what sort of microbiological epidemiology we might find, and also we wanted to obviously look at important outcomes, primarily mortality. Um, so what we found is with a with a case definition that sort of um, uh, was attempting to find the sweet spot between sensitivity and specificity. We had uh, culture positivity amongst 18% of these um, 3,200 and a few infants. And the mortality um, was high, but was higher amongst culture positive infants uh, of, of whom almost one in five died. And we saw really um, something that um, very much reflects the, the picture that Uduak was presenting before, a dominance of gram-negative bacteria in these culture-positive infants. Um, but 
uh, quite interestingly, the exact patterns of which species were dominant were very site specific, meaning that some sites were really Klebsiella sites, other sites um, had more of a, a, an issue with Enterobacter species or Serratia or in fact even Acinetobacter. And um, in line with that, and again, as has as been described before, there isn't really a standard of care regimen, despite recommendations from the WHO to the contrary, that most um, of the infants in, the, in this cohort study received as the first empiric treatment uh, when they were clinically identified to be suffering from sepsis. And... Um, taking into account the, the relatively high resistance rates that, again, we also observe, we also found that very commonly what would be considered second line or even last resort antibiotics were used as the first line um, treatment. And this has various implications for wanting to do a, a randomized control trial to generate gold standard evidence about optimal antibiotic management of neonatal sepsis at, at, on a global scale. Because in a typical a randomized controlled um, trial, not just for, for neonatal sepsis, but really um, as, a, as a concept, um, there is a very important primary assumption. And that is that there is, in fact, a standard of care regimen that maximizes cure and minimizes toxicities or other unwanted effects. And that, in fact, evidence that is generated in trials is generated iteratively, and it's always referencing back to this standard of care, either to demonstrate something is superior or is non-inferior. And the added inherent assumption of this is that benefits and risks of um, this um, uh, regimen and also the comparator regimens are always in lockstep. So something that maximizes cure cannot also have more toxicity. And we know in real life that that isn't true for antibiotics. So something that's more broad spectrum might be more effective, but it would also, for example, be considered to be more problematic from a, a point of view of, of stewardship and, and emergence of additional resistance. So um, you can see that um, uh, this, this standard of care concept is, is very problematic. And um, just to expand on this a little bit more, of course, neonatal sepsis um, it can be caused by multiple bacteria, um, not necessarily in one episode, but you know, a, 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 looking at a baby um, suffering clinically from neonatal sepsis, you cannot tell which causative um, species is going to be present. And antibiotics must be given empirically, at which point uh, the etiology is unknown. And so therefore, um, we often use antibiotics that um, can treat a number of bacteria, but there isn't really an antibiotic um, or a regimen, in fact, that can um, treat everything. Um, so, so, so we always have this issue of where is going to be our gap and what is the, the optimum in this type of setting. And then finally, additional complexity is added by this issue of emerging and shifting antimicrobial resistance patterns. They both change the, the coverage of the um, regimens that one might be wanting to consider. And also resistance is obviously influenced by the antibiotics being, uh, being used. So the research problem isn't the typical RCT problem of, you know, is my regimen X um, better or not worse than the standard of care regimen that I'm currently using, but you're really trying to uh, generate robust evidence for optimal treatment on a number of planes that address the severity and diversity of the disease and of the causative species and the direct and indirect impacts of, of, of antimicrobial resistance. So if you want to translate this into a typical PICO framework, you know, then, of course, you are conducting a, a trial um, focusing on uh, newborns with uh, clinical sepsis. And you can see our more specific criteria um, listed here. Um, but you don't really have this typical split into intervention and comparator, but you have multiple regimens that you may be interested in, um, both regimens already in use, um, as well as potentially some novel combinations or novel agents. 
And you want to evaluate the impact of these uh, multiple regimens on a primary outcome. Um, so that is something that is, is a, the, almost a pillar of, of any RCT. Um, in our case, we're interested in 28-day mortality, but we're recognizing that there are additional efficacy, effectiveness, safety, and other endpoints that might be quite critical to for a, an individual neonatal unit or an individual setting to select which which regimens um, are really most appropriate for use uh, in their setting. So the NEOCEP solution to this is to um, essentially adapt what is, uh, is a multi-arm, multi-stage design. For those of you who are uh, a little bit more trial sav savvy, that's perhaps uh, meaningful to you. Uh, and the way that we're adapting this is that we allow more stratified or personalized uh, randomizations to a selection of regimens that is really adapted to the infant that um, uh, is in front of you. And this has a very um, complex statistical underbelly that I'm not going to touch on uh, uh, today, but um, this, this design called a practical design is currently used by us, but is also being explored by several other groups for uh, these entities other than neonatal sepsis. And so the research question then becomes, out of the X acceptable antibiotic regimens for this particular infant, based on some criteria that can be uh, preset, which is the most likely to result in good clinical outcomes? So in the end, you have a result that identifies one of the best out of multiple options, but not against the standard of care. And this design also helps you to identify which are the worst options, taking into account a variety of factors, some of whom are really very essential, like availability. So sites would not actually randomize to an antibiotic that would not be available to them outside of the trial. And so for NeoCEP, this is how this is operationalized. Um, there is a, a master randomization list that includes the uh, regimens that you can see here. Um, uh, so this is um, the pool of regimens that um, sites can select from, and each site will select first-line treatment options based on site factors, so knowledge of their own resistance epidemiology, for example, and baby factors. And to give you an example, this is um, one of the randomization lists that is then generated for one of our sites um, for babies presenting with early onset sepsis. This site typically uses ampicillin gentamicin as uh, the first line empiric treatment. And they said they would be happy to randomize to this and the three new comparators that Uduak already mentioned. Um, so this is something that uh, um, uh, is uh, then... Um, uh, implemented. But of course, all the clinicians will be aware that not every infant will respond to this primary empirical therapy. So if no further provision is made for this need to escalate treatment, potentially in a subset of babies, you end up with some things that can really break your trial. So either protocol defined escalations or clinician defined escalations. So in fact, in this trial, we're combining a practical with a smart design where we are um, incorporating a second randomization that doesn't make any assumptions on what the best second line treatment um, may be. And this will also allow us uh, to estimate the impact of combined sequential strategies. So for this baby who may be randomized to phosphomycin amikacin and is perhaps showing a poor response to this uh, first line uh, regimen, they, they would then undergo a second line randomization contingent on the first line treatment um, uh, regimens and side factors. So some would just not be available because they would not be expanding the spectrum sufficiently to justify um, including them on a randomization list. So in the end, the trial will look like this. Um, babies who are doing well, um, will just complete the follow-up um, and babies who are deteriorating or not improving would undergo a second randomization. Now, this I've given you a really a big romp through this um, very briefly, but this is quite uh, uh, complex, as you can imagine. And in order to not let all the work that has been done on this go to waste and to connect this to other research activities happening in the space of uh, neonatal sepsis, we've actually been lucky to be funded to uh, create a severe neonatal infection platform. This 
uh, platform has its roots in Africa, as it happens. Um, and you can see the partners that are involved here. And um, this structure will enable us to really combine uh, the NeoSEP trial, which you can see here, with some additional research activities such as pharmacokinetics, so answering questions around dose, uh, but also some capacity building, training and stakeholder engagement um, to allow us to essentially expand this trial domain um, so that we can accommodate additional um, uh, trials in that platform and hopefully also expand it beyond uh, Africa to include uh, more of the global south. So with that, um, I'd like to um, finish. Please email me also if you have uh, want to reach out, you want to find out more, because I realize it's a pretty uh, complex trial. And um, you can see that this is something that's obviously the work of many people, not just myself, uh, in particularly, uh, particular the CNPI team and MRCCTU teams. Um, and you can see the team members listed here. So my thanks to them also. Thank you so much, Dr. Bialiki. This uh, NeoSAP is... It's a very interesting work. I wish we had all the time. You know, I would have loved to, to listen more, but our time is really over. Thank you for that exciting exposition of the work that you guys do at the NeoSAP. Um, we have a question here, but we don't have any more time. And I think someone had already answered that question. And that is, can Miropinam be given in neonates and infant in extended infusion in two hours? And someone says in four hours, and I hope that is correct. We do not have time so much to discuss this. Um, so I uh, I honestly do feel so pleasured to have moderated this session. And I want to give special thanks to our very intelligent um, and highly experienced speakers for sharing your experience and uh, you know loading us up with new information and data on neonatal sepsis. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our technical crew and the officers at the world uh, Sepsis Congress and Global Sepsis Alliance for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much. And for the audience from around the world, if you missed any of this, I think in a couple of days, the recording will be up on YouTube um, and I think also on Apple TV. I would ask you to oblige us this request. If you don't mind to um, uh, like us, tag us on any of the social media that you have interest in. At this point, uh, we are going to sign off. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity.